Okay, thank you very much, dear friends. Uh, first of all, I must congratulate for such a wonderful uh, interactive session and uh, wonderful deliberation by Professor Lakshmi Darbara. I want to thank the organization and uh, my friend, Dr. Jyoti Dindin for giving me this opportunity. Well, I am coming from a clinical science. I'm a neurologist and uh, I have my limitation as far as the basic science is concerned. You can understand that. But my work is mainly on meditation uh, and its benefits on scientific analysis part from mind, brain and body and a lot of other things. I would not drag myself much into the uh, discussion about what is mind, what is brain and what is body. Uh, I would rather skip that con conveniently because the subject is still quite uh, debatable as you know very well. Uh, but my question uh, to, you know, uh, before we discuss what is meditation, what are the uh, benefits of meditation and what are the scientific things, I mean, let us understand uh, and come on a common page, uh, what is meditation all about? It's an exercise of mind to keep it healthy and clean as we do for body. So like a physical exercise, a mental exercise, a state of altered consciousness. We call it a four state of consciousness in some connotation. It's a spiritual ecstasy with a neurological manifestation. Those neurological manifestations are not now hallucination. We have now reproduced in the laboratory several times in the same person, different person and with different meditative techniques. I, I will uh, show some of the uh, data. But my caution, as uh, Dr. Lakshmi has also said, that we can't reduce all of our spiritual experiences and personal experiences uh, into a mere mm -hmm. biological phenomena, physiological phenomena, or with markers or some. There are some spiritual experiences which are undescribable, and hitherto they are not recordable. Still, science has come to some way, and that will try to show. You know that the consciousness range from complete unconsciousness to total awareness and somewhere in the middle you have control processes, automatic processes, uh, daydreaming and somewhere it's meditative state, hypnotic state and a sleep state, etc, etc. So what is meditation? The definitions are very and many. Some say it is stability of mind, some say where the wavering of mind is stopped. Some say it is concentration. Some say it is contemplation. Some say it's unified thought process. Some say it is transcendence, introspection, self-regulation, dedication, self-staying connected with the Supreme. All these are different uh, definitions. Wikipedia defines this thinking, thinking deeply or spiritually about a subject, a practice through a technique such as mindfulness or focus by a person to train attention, awareness to achieve a mentally clear and emotionally calm state. That is how people define meditation. It's a complex cognitive task. It is more than relaxation, concentration, contemplation or posturing or it is summation of all this. Frees, it frees the mind from distractions and allows for communication with the master within. And the ultimate goal of meditation is illumination and enlightenment. Friends, meditation is hard work. It demands the highest form of discipline, which comes through constant awareness, not only of the things about you outwardly, but also inwardly. So it's not simply a push button system. It's a very hard work. So the title mentions scientific analysis of benefits. So let us enumerate some of the benefits. Physical, mental, and emotional health is one of the outcomes of good meditative practices. Cure or partial control of psychosomatic disorders, including lifestyle disease or uh, um, mind-generated disease, or high blood pressure, coronary, diabetes, asthma, rheumatism. Mind you, my meditation do not, does not cure all of them. Many times it just helps control because it is the byproduct that our disease are controlled. The meditation is actually meant for some higher purpose, which we'll see very shortly. 
is useful for stress relief. It improves spiritual health for concentration, sharpness, relaxation, improving job performance, interpersonal relationship. It brings change of attitude, brings inner peace, patience, happiness, cultivates and promotes positive emotions and removes negative thoughts. It helps in controlling anger and conquering fear. It brings control over thought process, quality of life, and for those who are in higher meditative states, there is something called intuitive knowledge. They have healing powers, magnetic personality, and occult powers. The neurochemistry and neurophysiology of meditation is just the reverse of stress. Stress, as we know, is an overactivity of sympathetic system. Meditation is overactivity of parasympathetic system. But as I mentioned earlier, it is not a push button system. Every Tom, Dick and Harry cannot uh, learn meditation like that. You need to have patience. There is a very high dropout rate. You need to have right guide. If you want to persist on the lines of meditation, on the path of meditation, you need to have right guide, right method, correct understanding, appropriate place, a constant practice, extreme conviction and faith. It is not a matter of going to sleep while meditating. It is not a simple relaxation response. But unfortunately, meditation industry is booming and there is commercialization. Everybody is selling the meditation packets. That is not the way it should be. However, I must mention that most of the meditative systems are pretty good. You don't have to make comparison that my system is better or this system is not good. No, no. All systems are good. It depends on whom and how you follow and pursue properly. But the real purpose of meditation, which I mentioned some of the benefits, uh, they are not like that. The real purpose of meditation, according to Vedanta and other, other spiritual, spiritual texts and scriptures, is to remain in the present state, present moment, to learn to eliminate our ego from elimination of mind from man to aman, how you get out of the control of your mind on yourself. You take charge of yourself, that is aman takriya. And then even the higher philosophical purpose is philosophical self-realization, God-realization, total bliss and total liberation. Friends, unless we all do our cells meditation, we will not understand what I'm talking about. I have been doing meditation for the last 25 years. I have learned some of the techniques at depth and I can now vouch. And having done a lot of experiments and seen and attended them, I can tell you as a neurologist and a clinician that this all are actually meaningful things. This all really can happen if we really follow the path properly. Rumi, the great mystic poet, said in one line regarding meditation, please do me a little favor. Search your own self within yourself. Chota sa ek kaam kar, tere hi andar tu teri tapas kar. That is meditation. Now, before we go into the real scientific analysis, which is the main subject for my today's talk, and uh, over which I've spent a lot of years, the meditation techniques can be broadly divided uh, in, in terms of uh, technicality. Either you focus on breathing, focus on object like we do in Patanjali meditation, focus on a sound, sound meditation, focus on a thought like in uh, Smriti Upasthan, focus on breathing is Anapansati, focus on a sensual object, focus on sensory perception that is Vipassana, guided imagery as we do in ICU in a lot of uh, American institutes, and of course, meditation on your own soul, consciousness. In neurological terms, the meditation differs uh, uh, to be, you know, you can define either as a concentration meditation contemplation or simple mindful observation technique, and third is effortful, effortless trance-treading. So these are three simpler definitions of meditation in terms of neurology. 
Now, meditation includes a complex group of techniques. We have said there are Indian tradition, Buddhist, yoga tradition, Chinese tradition, Taoism, Jain Buddhism, Western, Christian, Hebrew, Islam, mystic currents, and so many. In Indian uh, uh, scriptures, we have 122 systems as described in Bhairav Vignan, and there are thousands of uh, various modifications ramifications. So you can have your own uh, system for yourself tailor-made. Right from Patanjana Dhyan to Anapan, Sati to Smriti Upasthan, Vipassana, Preksha Dhyan, Jain Dhyan, Spanda Dhyan, Mantra Dhyan, and so on. I can go and go on. But today's um, topic is not about the art of medicine or technicality of medicine, how to do meditation. I saw in chat box so many people have asked questions how to tame mind, what kind of meditation can help, etc., etc. Friends, I would be able to answer some of your questions from the scientific perspective. So kindly have a patient listen. One of the systems is Patanjal Raj Yoga, you know, classic Ashtang Raj Yoga, where you have Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyar, Dharana, Dhyan, and Samadhi. There is another Vipassana system where the this person is mind. Mind itself is the sufferer. The surgeon who is doing the operation is also mind. And the instruments to do surgery is also of mind. So you need a calm and quiet mind, awake and attentive mind, and equanimous mind. And this works on thought as well as perversion. This system uh, vikar pe bhi kaam karti hai, vichar pe bhi kaam karti hai. Another is mindfulness practice. Again, as I mentioned, I'm not going to talk anything about the system, how it uh, should be done. But I'm just mentioning few names because maximum studies mm, are done from neuroscience perspective you know, on these or four or five systems. Transcendental meditation, propounded mainly by Maharshi Yogi, uh, is, and uh, there are some Buddhist meditation like uh, Jajain, Chang, Tonglen, and then Qigong, and so many other meditations. So all over the world, there are different systems people follow. Now coming to the basic thing, science of meditation, how to analyze scientifically the benefits, etc. Meditation friends produce this is a scientific physiological response pattern that involves various biological systems. I studied these with uh, my colleagues from counterparts from USA and some of them from UK. And we saw that mechanism producing meditative effects include metabolic, autonomic, endocrine, neurological, and psychological manifestations. Physiological response to meditation occurs on a multi-dimensional interactive basis. Okay. The oxygen consumption during meditation is reduced by 16%. Can you believe in sleep, our oxygen consumption is reduced by 12%. So the efficient way is meditation to reduce oxygen consumption. It's neural structures that are intimately related to the control of autonomic nervous system are finally activated. So parasympathetic is activated, sympathetic is suppressed. Therefore, your stress responses go down and your relaxation responses, yogic mode starts in operating. Again, the diurnal cyclical secretion of stress hormones uh, is absent, so the circadian rhythm changes. The metabolism improves for better, there is a decreased uh, breathing rate, there is a decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, so the system, biological system of our body operates in a very efficient way. Blood flow to kidney and liver are declined. Uh, oxygen utilization, I already said. Ultimately, what does this do? This transforms into longevity and delayed aging. And you must have seen those who are avid, chronic, meditative people, they live long, peacefully, and their aging process is reduced. They are very vibrant people. And we have a lot of people in Vedanta group also who, who are doing regular connection with the Supreme. Even by chanting good mantra like Hare Krishna or Om Namah Shivai or Sri Krishna Shannam Mama or maybe Om Namo Yantam, one can get uh, connected to sound meditation. 
statistic says that a lot of physicians psychotherapists and other professionals are increasingly adding meditative techniques to their practice and many physicians consider meditation as a key element of an integrated health program now this is a good news for medicine and neurology and what are the condition let's start with the health for the scientific analysis from arthritis allergies asthma hypertension coronary disease to irritable bowel heartburn constipation migraine tension headache menstrual discomfort menopause back pain depression anxiety substance abuse to skin disease psoriasis etc chronic fatigue syndrome even obesity and sleep problems these are either lifestyle or psychosomatic disorder and these are addressed beautifully by meditation but once again please remember the purpose of meditation is self realization it is for liberation for atma gyan it is not Well, that we do meditation to remove our arthritis or allergies. It's a byproduct. Please understand this properly. So well, there are lots of paper on PubMed, internet, etc. You'll find that with six, seven weeks of meditation, how cancer uh, uh, manifestations are changed. At least the pain, the anxiety, etc. is reduced. Chronic pain, anxiety, and panic disorders, fibromyalgia. Psychosomatic disorders like asthma, rheumatism, how it is useful, irritable bowel and inflammatory reaction as seen in biomarkers, physical stress, radiate uh, expression, psoriasis, carotid artery, wall thickness, coronary narrowing, and so on. It was shown that meditative people have fifty percent less doctors' office visit and average fifty percent less hospital admission. And this you can find out from the PubMed. There are lots of papers, but you know, uh, these uh, does not manage meditation is not the panacea. It won't cure all of them. It might have some beneficial effect from 20 to 80 percent uh, in many of these diseases. Heart disease program, you know, the Dean Ornish program and Manchanda et al. have demonstrated that management stress of stress through meditation and change to healthy diet and exercise habits can halt the progress of coronary artery blockage and actually show reversal of coronary blockage. Same Dr. Gupta from Mount Abu and others have shown almost the same thing. So I'm just bringing as a panoramic view. I don't want to discuss all these studies because it is of not much uh, relevance as far as uh, what I'm going to talk further. So life expectancy, cancer, and other things. So these are different areas where people have studied different meditative techniques, uh, especially vipassana. Uh, Mindfulness practice, uh, transcendental meditation, etc. Who cannot do or who should not do meditation? People suffering from psychosis, severe depression, confused mental states, extreme anxiety and dementia. They are not qualified to do meditation because some of them cannot do or should not do. Coming back to the physiology of meditation, now mechanism. Produce mechanisms producing meditative effects include metabolic, autonomic, endocrine, neurological, and psychological manifestation. Now, neurology mainly chemical changes, electrical, EEG changes, biological changes in uh, metabolism changes and blood flow related changes. Now, physiological response to meditation occurs such on a multi-dimensional interactive way. Dr. Lakshmi has already Lakshmi Sarji has already talked about alpha, beta, theta, delta. So I will not uh, waste my time. But I will take rather advantage of what he said. So how does meditation help neuroelectrically? Well, there will be increased alpha production, increased theta production, increased high beta production, depending upon uh, meditator uses which technique to some extent. Alpha patterns are associated with calm and focus attention, as you do in Patanjali system. Theta patterns are associated with reverie, imagery, and creativity, and they are usually seen during uh, contemplative meditation. High beta activity is associated with high focus concentration, like uh, 
compassionate activity or tractor, etc. Now, this is not uh, one to one. There are some variations, there is some overlap. Establishing alpha activity in spite of open eyes is one of the important parameters that we study and uh, increase amplitude of alpha, synchronicity, rhythmic theta, and uh, in, in fact, we see hypersynchronization during some of the meditative states between right and left hemisphere. Dissociation of perception from the external sense organ and transcendental signal. So this is, uh, even during the first meditative experiment, we have found that people show change in brave wave pattern uh, and decrease in beta activity after meditation. In nutshell, the meditation brave wave pattern, the people, those people who are doing meditation for years, and for a long period of time, maybe one hour or more, they develop a specific, this is a computational way of showing the pattern. The meditation brainwave pattern is a combination of alpha and theta, where theta provides the depth and profundity of the meditation experience in the subconscious inner space from which creativity, insight, and healing springs. And alpha provides the bridge or the link to the conscious thinking. So there is a conscious thinking mind, there is a creative experience, there is an intuitional thing, there is a, a, in, a healing experience and a profound peace. All this is granted to meditate. Davidson and others have shown repetitively the, uh, that the left prefrontal cortex is a brain region associated with happiness and positive thoughts and emotions. Using functional MRI technique, fMRI on the meditative monks, Davidson found that their brain activity as measured by MEG, magnetoencephalogram, was especially high in this area. So with chronic meditation, gamma wave activity, high level information processing found in many meditators. So friends, uh, summing up uh, about the neural electricity, elect EG effect, when you do focus attention, uh, like concentration techniques, gamma and beta activity, gamma in the range of 30 to 50, or beta 2 in 20 to 30, well, this is due to voluntary control of attention and cognitive process. Is like loving kind, compassional meditation, qigong, etc. Well, during the open monitoring techniques like vipassana and mindfulness, you get a dispassionate, non evaluative awareness of ongoing experiences. You get open monitoring theta in the range of five to eight hertz, like in vipassana and Zen meditation, etc. In automatic transcendenting kind of uh, meditation, uh, you have automatic uh, transmitting signal of alpha and that you see in TM meditation. So friends, in meditation, the usual framework of time, space and other aspects of conscious content are absent, although the mind is not asleep. This is a very profound statement, friends. The usual scientific model so far used to take account of uh, space, matter and uh, time, you know, in explaining the universe, the theory of everything. But unless we put the consciousness in this uh, paradigm, we will not be able to explain theory of everything anywhere. So uh, this is one of the, I wish I had more time to explain all these details. Anyway, uh, so now I go directly to the um, core aspect, that is what is neurobiology of meditation. We have seen electricity, there is a EEG changes. Now we see neurobiology and then we see neurochemistry and neuropsychology. This is very important. Imaging studies uh, usually do with the regional cerebral blood flow, real time MRI, magnetoencephalogram superimposition and uh, uh, we allow detailed studies in understanding the effects of meditation in neural network and neural behavior. So what is SPECT? SPECT is single photon emission computerized tomography. Parietal area of the brain is responsible for giving us a sense of orientation in space and time. But it is the left PSPL, posterior superior parietal lobule. Now, by blocking all sensory and cognitive input to this area, Meditation results in the sense of no space and no time. Please mark these words. When you do deep meditation, your parietal area goes offline. So you don't remain in touch with the space and time. And you operate on a universal conscious level or your own consciousness. So therefore, you are not getting manifested. This is very, very important. 
I'll come to that. So these are different tools that we use, uh, MEGF, MRI, PET, etc. And uh, my friend, uh, my counterpart, if you say, Dr. Andrew Newberg had done the wonderful path-breaking study of the measurement of the regional cerebral blood flow during the complex cognitive task of meditation, a preliminary spec study. I had met him a couple of times during my studies on prolonged fasting. And what he did, he brought the Tibetan Lama and he studied the cerebral system into SPAC machine and look what happened. He found out that this is a SPAC of brain. Uh, this is the prefrontal area, what Dr. Lakshmidhar was showing that this is connected with cognitive experiences, intelligence, higher memory, judgment, prioritization, executive function, planning, behavior, and all that. You know, this red is uh, showing the blood flow. Before uh, meditation, that is baseline, you see the blood flow. And after meditation, for maybe 45 to 60 minutes, you can see there's 30% nearly increase of blood flow. So your cognitive experiences, your intelligence, etc., your pragya is enhanced with meditation. And, and think of people who are doing meditation for years together. They have very high uh, evolution of their own uh, intellect, their uh, uh, mental processes, their behavior, etc., becomes very, very beautiful. The another important outcome of meditation, you see, this is the parietal area. I'm showing the left parietal area, uh, which I mentioned briefly before. After meditation, the blood flow actually shuts down, starts shutting down. So during depth of profound meditation, the blood flow shuts down. And as I mentioned, this is the area of orientation to time, place, and even to person. Our manifestation as a person and our ego is due to our orientation to time and space and time person also. Now, uh, with the shutting down of blood flow here, you don't manifest with your ego and all the, the thoughts, your emotions, your desires, etc. basically related to your orientation of this time, place, and etc. etc. And people have worked a lot on this subject, applying Vedant and other uh, religious uh, practices uh, and their the theories how we can take use of this particular finding that we are able to cut down our uh, desires, thought, ego, emotions, and uh, we, we remain as it is and our, our rag, dvesh, attachment and aversions are reduced during meditation. So on one side, there is increase in your blood flow in your frontal area and reduction in blood flow in the area of mind, which we call uh, emotions, desires, thoughts, etc. So this is a double beneficiary effect. And third is the increased uh, parasympathetic output so that we have reduction in, in uh, uh, stress hormones, uh, reduction in pulse, blood pressure, respiration. Your parasympathetic system is your yogic system. You slow down. Your pulse becomes slow. Your respiration deepens, etc. So during meditation, these autonomic nervous system effects are also very well uh, demonstrated. So this is not hallucination. This is a neurobiological event. It has been demonstrated again and again. And many meditators have similar findings. And in many studies, it has been shown. And if you look at the chart of uh, how in different brain areas, uh, what percentage of uh, blood flow, etc., changes, you will find that maximum changes occur in orbital frontal cortex, thalami, cingulate body, where there is increased blood flow and reduction in blood flow will see in the parietal and some of the other areas. Even during uh, meditating prayers, there are changes in the limbic system and uh, ultimately in the autonomic nervous system. If I supplement it with the fMRI during meditation, what happens? More or less same thing, but we, we had some detailed information. PET, SPECT, and fMRI allow examination of changes in regional blood flow, metabolism, or receptor activation. And uh, most types of meditation which you know an initial focusing of attention, like concentration, frontal, uh, are associated with increased regional blood flow 
or glucose metabolism in the prefrontal in cingulate cortex. The frontal lobes, as I mentioned, uh, especially the prefrontal regions help executive function, organization, prioritization, and focus. If you use visualization system, the regional blood flow increases in the visual cortex and visual associated in the occipital lobes. In contemplation of cell, the parietal lobes on both sides are activated first. But ultimately, the circuit opens that way that all the areas are getting connected. It is a matter of time which area is first activated depends on which meditative techniques you are using. Now, these are not as simple as I'm saying. It is a very complex thing and uh, don't misunderstand me. But whatever science has understood and with my limited uh, knowledge, what I have deciphered while doing a lot of studies and understanding and reading, I have found that definitely meditation helps in a lot of uh, issues. If you do visual imagery, the occipital cortex, as you can see, it gets activated first. In the meditation on weight of body parts, different parts, the systems are activated. When you are happy or joyful, you have a different set of uh, neural networks activated. And when you are contemplating on yourself, the soul meditation, you have a different single pointed area which you get uh, highlighted. And friends, uh, you should understand the four uh, real players during meditation are frontal lobe, parietal lobe, thalamus, and reticular formation. Reticular formation, as you know, it is a sentry. Uh, and this structure receives information uh, from incoming stimuli and puts the brain on alert. You know, this is at the back. Now, thalamus is the gatekeeper. It, uh, it, 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 this organ focuses your attention by funneling some of the sensory uh, data deeper into the brain and stopping other signals in the track. Meditation reduces the flow of incoming information to trickle. And frontal lobe and parietal lobe, I already mentioned how they get affected. So friends, during fMRI, what was seen by different uh, researchers, thalamus is a relaxation and uh, excitation of RN through prefrontal cortex decreases the activation of PSPL, that is posterior superior parietal lobe, and thereby decrease body awareness and also decreases input to visual center. So my friends, those of you who are not meditating, please start, learn some meditation techniques from an expert and try at least start doing, you will understand what I'm saying. It, it is a profound experience and it cannot be described in words. This deafferentation of PSPL takes you to a very deep state of peace. You are free of your thoughts, desires, emotions, and uh, your perversion, aversion, and ego attitude. So uh, you are quite in a state of you know, control of your mind because these are the activities of mind and that bothers us, that makes us, that makes us unhappy. And we have to get rid of this processing. The functional deprivation means a decrease in uh, distracting stimuli to visual cortex. This results in altered perception of self-experience. So these are the different results that I mentioned. To sum up functional MRI correlate, uh, in the Tibetan Buddhism system, there is increased frontal, increased thalamic uh, blood flow and decreased parietal. In transcendental meditation, frontal parietal is increased while thalamic uh, stimulation goes down. In Vipassana, ultimately what has been described is that you know there is a neuroplasticity effect the thicker right insula thicker right frontal area sensory area and this is how uh, you know very complex schematic overview of the neurophysiological network possibly associated with meditative state you can learn and study from the net anyway so there are different studies that are quoted here and uh, uh, then I will go quickly for a few, uh, I think I have last five, six minutes. So meditation includes serotonin, acetylcholine, melatonin, etc. Availability. These are the powerful uh, serotonin is for your mood and memory and uh, uh, happiness. Acetylcholine is mainly for memory mechanism and attention. Melatonin is for relaxation. 
And during meditation, the other thing that is beneficial is the neurochemically the locus cerulus activity, which is the driver of sympathetic uh, hormones, particularly norepinephrine, is reduced. So you become stressless and parasympathetic activity goes on. So this is the chart uh, of neurochemical changes of different uh, neurotransmitters and of uh, you know during uh, meditation. So. You can see that GABA, the peace hormone, increases, serotonin increases, while cortisol, the stress hormone, decreases, endorphin increases, and the diurnal cycle is used. It also, meditation affects the autonomic nervous system also. There is decreased limbic arousal in the brain that reduces stress and increases autonomic stability stress. One becomes compassionate, non-judgmental, calm. And reduction in limbic arousal may explain how meditation strengthens and enhances the ability to cope with stress. Central so nervous system, uh, we have studied the, that it decreases muscle reflex time. The neurotransmitters are uh, changed uh, that way that there is a decreased synaptic time, there is augmental neural conduction. But this line is most important. Please read this carefully. By inhibiting the left cortical hemisphere, the sense of time and logic no longer dominate consciousness during meditation. If you have done, many of you might be doing, you must have realized that there is no sense of time and logic during conscious uh, meditative effort. And th that suppresses the ego faculty. The person becomes polite, calm, and later, all the mental activities which we mentioned repeatedly, thought, emotions, desires, ego, they are all reduced. So, man may say aman hune ki prakriya. From mind to mindless, or you can say control of your mental process by your consciousness, that is what is a derivation of meditation. You can talk about default net network also. Without that, you know, talk on meditation is not complete, but you know that it is a, when you are doing uh, past experience based uh, meditation or uh, when you are navig navigating your personal biological experiences, the brain's default network operates and that is what is first beneficial. Out of all these experiments, what we learn, the plausible hypothesis like this, when meditation acts as a constant repetitive stimulus, certain permanent qualitative and quantitative changes develop in nervous system. Neurotransmitters and neuromodulators may stimulate growth of dormant neurons to develop a center higher than neocortex. Now, we as human beings have developed from paleomammalian to neomammalian now, from reptilians. And here during meditation, the norm, dormant neurons become active and that takes charge of the neocortex, which is what one we are thriving on. And that produces negative control on neocortex. So your mental activities are completely in charge of yourself. The spiritual ascent is from the least evolved state of consciousness to near perfect state with which the mind itself will cease to be or be controlled totally and there will remain only non-dual experience which Vedan talks very proficiently. So this is the derivation of medicine. This is the mathematics of medicine. Neuroplasticity, people have studied Lazar et al. has published study in 2004 where they have mentioned how uh, and why the thickness of the frontal cortex, the frontal cortex was higher in autopsy in people who were doing meditation for a long time. Their memory and uh, their aging effect was also reduced because of that biologically. And my last few slides, meditation psychology. Practice of meditation improves cognitive task performance, increases mental concentration, and reduces susceptibility to stress. Both subject and object examination reveal that meditation enhances perceptual sensitivity. It improves, my friends, our attitude, personality, our attention, greater productivity. We saw this in, during the listing meditation benefits, and these are all actually studied in science, problem solving capacity, creativity, bonding, higher learning, organization of memory, self-image enhancement, and the reduction to um, stress situation response or catastrophic reaction reduce compassion and tolerability increases. And friends, the most important thing to me is attitude. 
the longer i live the more i realize the impact of attitude on my life attitude to me is more important than facts it is more important than the past than education successes than what other people think or say or do attitude is more important than appearances giftedness or skill it, is, it will make or break a company a church a home the remarkable thing if we have is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day we cannot change our past can we no we can't change the fact that people will act in a certain way we cannot change the inevitable the only thing we can do is to play on the only string that we have and that is our attitude i am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how i react to it and so it is with you my friends we are in charge of our attitudes what a wonderful lines you know written by charles you know, and their friends meditation for sure changes our attitude so let us all learn meditation the implication on psychiatry uh, there is mind part are many from meditation is a complement in alternative meditation to some extent it can be altered to hypnosis is low cost can be continued for lifetime it can be used for group dynamics and group practice for cbt and all but there are certain unresolved frontiers which i should bring to attention the last two slides although we can understand and how the various lobes and neurotransmitter function during meditation which i have tried to show in a very short but elaborate way how are these actions directed and by whom what directs that what accounts for the actual awareness of the experience and of self and where are they perceived where do we perceive all this how do we actually know that something is true and meaningful and what accounts for this conviction so the link within the master within and the cosmic consciousness as lok lakshmi dev was saying has not been explained and cannot be approached from the pure neuroscience perspective so these are the lines written by me and it is falls in science of vedant and philosophy of vedant everything we hear is an opinion we it may not be a fact everything we see is a perspective it may not be the truth everything we feel is a perception my perception may not be your perception it may not be the reality and everything is likely to change so be judgmental and strive after your own truth and friend now we know why we have to do meditation pain is inevitable but suffering is optional that there is a problem buddha's four arya satya you know that there is a problem everybody has a problem life itself is a problem that there is a cause of the problem we should know why we are suffering and if there is a cause there has to be a way and what is the cause our own miseries are due to our activities of mind thoughts our desires our emotions our perceptions our rag dvesh attachment all these create havoc that create our unhappiness and the way yes there is a way sadhana meditation jap etc these are the ways 